What I want to talk about today is, um, well, can we make this quieter? I feel like it's picking up every little, like when I, uh, so what I want to talk about today is just uh, managing, managing asynchrony in general. So I guess first raise your hand if you know JavaScript. I'm hoping many people will raise their hand. Awesome, great. Uh, so um, I'm using JavaScript mostly as an example. Uh, almost everything I will say here applies to other languages except that JavaScript has uh, fewer built-in tools for managing asynchrony than other languages. So uh, once we get past the like general purpose ideas, we're going to have to talk about how things actually work in JavaScript. But the, the basic idea of this talk is when people normally talk about managing uh, asynchrony in applications, whether they be UI applications or network applications, they normally don't differentiate between what an application should be doing and what a framework or library should be doing. And what that usually ends up meaning is that people think that because there is asynchrony in the underlying system, because the network has asynchrony or because there are users that have asynchrony, your entire application should be modeled as an asynchronous application. I happen to not agree with that perspective. Um, my perspective is that you should try to hide the asynchrony um, in the abstractions that um, <clears throat> in abstractions that are not what you do when you're dealing with the application day to day. Um, and I will talk first about how you should do, how I think you should do that in network applications and then how you should do that in UI applications and talk about why those things are different. Um, so first of all, uh, there are actually two different types of asynchrony in, in, that are in high level important differences. Um, there is asynchrony in which the asynchronous events come in in deterministic order. So if you have a network protocol, if you have I.O., right, if you have I.O. and there's an asynchronous callback, the asynchronous callback is not there because who knows what could happen. Anything could happen. The asynchronous callback is there because it's going to take some time to go do the thing and then you're going to get back the result later. But you're guaranteed that because you have asked for I would like you to read this file, that later you will get the file and you are guaranteed that you only care about the, that result. You don't care about anything else that may happen in between. So there's uh, asynchrony that is basically based on deterministic order. And then there's asynchrony that is based on non-deterministic order. And non-deterministic order is things like user events. So you cannot predict or control uh, when a user will click on something, type in something, or anything like that. Nor do you actually want to block the entire application until the user does one particular action. So the idea that uh, unlike network events, you're never going to, you don't want to say, hey, uh, I would like to wait now until the user does something. And we have a couple of cases in browser-based applications where we do these things, where we say like there's confirm or prompt or alert, and in all these cases, it's basically obviously wrong, right? You don't actually, we don't actually want to pop up a modal and block the entire UI while the user, while waiting for the user to do something. And again, this is a little bit different from network where if you have made a request for a file, you don't really care about doing anything else until you got the response from the file. You might, your other parts of your application may want to do other things, but um, you don't actually care about anything else in between. Um, these are fundamentally different things from each other, um, but because they both are dealing with events as a concept, I think people often reach for the same tools. And I think that's why Node is very popular. I don't have, again, I, I like JavaScript and I don't have any problem with Node, but I think uh, the Node people have reached for modeling the entire system as asynchronous events because they're like, oh, browser has events, network has events, let's just do the same abstractions. Um, I don't mean that these should be different, uh, under the hood should be different. What I mean is that the higher level abstractions that you use to work with them should be different. And I think uh, this is sort of my thesis for the for this talk is, I don't think application code in general should be async. Um, you, may have, you may write an application and part of your application may be an abstraction around async code, but by and large you should not have, if you have a 10,000 line of code application or a 1,000 line of code application, most of that code should be written not in an async way. That doesn't mean synchronous blocking necessarily, but it means not in a way in which there are callbacks everywhere, basically, or in which you say do this and then do this thing later, specifically. Um, again, there may be some cases where it's appropriate. If you're writing a chat server, that's conceptually an asynchronous thing and you probably are going to want to use asynchronous style to write a chat server, maybe. But by and large, I'm not seeing people writing chat servers who write async code. I'm seeing people write really simple like request response HTTP things and then they're using async code because basically they think that that's the right higher level abstraction. 
So the first thing I want to do uh, before I go any further is just talk about what we mean by async code and um, talk a little bit about what the pieces of an async system are um, under the hood. Um, so let's say this is some node code. I think it's theoretical node code. No, this is real node code. So uh, go read a file, Etsy password, and then you take a function. Um, because for reasons unknown, uh, node basically makes you do error handling by constantly checking if there's an error passed in and rethrow it. The reasons are not unknown, but they're stupid. Um, and then you basically, in your callback, you do console.log data. And I, cl I claim that for, from a high level perspective, there's basically a, a five or six different things that go into this system and that those things are basically the same no matter how you actually model the behavior. Um, so the first thing is that there, there is going to end up being some kind of scheduler. This is a very stupid scheduler. You should not use this as a scheduler. But um, it gets the basic idea out there. So uh, you start with a new map and uh, you start, uh, callbacks are basically uh, a key which is basically a poll for whether something is ready or not and then a value which is a callback. So we start off with like yes and program a program function, and then while there's anything in the callbacks, loop through all the callbacks. If we pull the status and the status is ready, basically call the callback with the value that came back from the poll. Um, so this is, again, very, very stupid code, and that sleep 0.1 doesn't actually work. Um, you would probably want to coalesce all the similar callbacks together so that you were not having to actually pull a million things. And I'll, I'll talk about a little bit about that later. But from a high level, you basically have a series of things that are gonna be running, whether or not they're ready or not, and then when they're ready, invoke them with the value of what it means for them to be ready. So typically there is, uh, sorry, when you start a program, when you start a, a program, there's an initial program, and basically this is, I'll just, this is just like a picture of what I just showed. Um, the program gets popped off the stack, it might push more callbacks on, and then those things will go off the stack one at a time. And, uh, if none of them push anything else on the callback, eventually all the callbacks will be done and then the program will be over. So that's basically the high level. So now let's go back and look at this, eight, this little bit of async code. So we start off running the program, which is basically read this file. Uh, we run the program, it basically gets the program off and puts on, the only thing that it did was put one callback on the stack, which has like conceptually the idea of is this file ready or not? And then eventually the file will be ready, the callback will be invoked, and then the program will be over. Right? So it's basically, um, what you're basically doing is just re repeatedly doing the same thing. I have a bunch of callbacks. Is the, is the callback ready to be invoked? If it's ready to be invoked, invoke it. And maybe the callback will put more callbacks on. And then eventually there will be none left. So in almost all systems that deal with uh, evented I.O., they basically deal with primitive status in a similar way. Um, select is not always how you handle it. There are better uh, system calls than select, but um, basically there is some kind of system call that lets you say, here are a bunch of file descriptors for I.O. Please let me know when any of them has anything ready on it. And when, it's, when you tell me, I will then know, like here are the list of I.O.s that have something ready to be read. So um, if you remember in the previous slide, we made a uh, request for a file and we needed to basically know when to call the callback, so we will basically, under the hood, like Node and Ruby and Perl, basically are all doing this, and the kernel is doing something like this also. Uh, and then the primitive value is also like really simple. Um, you basically, you're gonna take the file, you're going to set it to be a non-blocking read, and then you go read it for however many bytes you feel like sending to the callback. So again, under the hood, uh, the reason why usually there is a lot of I semantics for I.O. around threads and not a lot for other things is because under the hood, you actually need some way of saying, am I ready or not? And uh, it usually uses I.O. Um, obviously in JavaScript, there are other things like timers, and those would also be, they would, those would not be using um, I.O., but they would be basically having this, they have the same two requirements, right? They have the requirement of like, am I ready or not? So for a timer, that's like, has the time elapsed? and they have the requirement of value for a timer, there is no value. Um, and then uh, we have to deal with error conditions and application callbacks, so it would be something like this is a not real version of what the C code would look like, right? So uh, if there was an error, call the callback with an error. Remember the first parameter is an error, otherwise call the callback with null and the value that we read into the buffer. 
So the, at a high level, the scheduler is something like this. You start a program, you receive a bunch of callbacks, which have an I.O. and a callback. When the program is done, check, let, use the select system call to find out which ones are ready. Um, if any of the I.O.s are ready, invoke the callback and start over. Keep doing that over and over again until there's no callbacks left. And I claim that when the order of these things is deterministic, what we want really is a sequential abstraction. That doesn't mean we want, uh, you can only run one thing at a time, because like this is the argument that node people use. If you use a sequential abstraction, you can only run one thing at a time. Uh, you don't want to run one thing at a time, but you do want to be able to pretend that things are sequential, because in fact, from the high level, they are sequential. And this is typically where people talk about threads. So I want to basically talk about threads in the same context. So let's go back to this async code. So imagine we have this async code. We read file, two different files, and console log the data. The first thing I want you to note is that in this async code, the actual order that these console logs will happen is unknown. And you cannot be sure that there's no shared state. Right? So in this case, you can see that there's no shared state. But it is actually relatively common in Node applications or, or JavaScript applications because the lexical scope is so promiscuous to just use the lexical scope as a shared scope. So it's, there's nothing in inherent in async code that stops us from having shared mutable state. And there's nothing that actually guarantees what order we will actually run the callbacks in. And so I'm, I'm just saying that out loud because people usually in my next slide will say, oh, those are reasons why you would not like to use threads. Those reasons also exist when you're running async code. And uh, the callback in the case of, of async code is basically you have a function body and whatever variables were visible. In our case, there are no variables. Typically, there would be some visible variables. And so the idea is that when you go to invoke the callback, you basically run the code and make the code have access to the variables that it had before. And this is what a closure is. And typically, there would be some optimal way of doing this that was not, that was not slow. Um, and you, you might also do this as instead of um, instead of having a closure, you might say, uh, here's an object and a function I want you to invoke, in which case you would not have to store off any um, additional state. But the basic idea is there's some code that you want to invoke and probably some object or hash or variable thing that you is, is associated with it. So that's what a callback looks like when you're doing regular async code. Now let's, uh, let's basically convert that exact same code to threads in an imaginary world where JavaScript has them, which will never happen. But let's imagine that JavaScript had threads. You would basically say, start me a new thread. And inside each thread, we can basically go and do a blocking. We can block. So we could say fs.readfile at c password. And in this case, fs.readfile blocks. And as soon as it's done, you will get the console log data. But because we did in a thread, we can go to do another thing. And here we will just sleep. So we'll sleep forever. So the program will never end. Typically, in an example like this, you would like join on the threads to make the program eventually end. Um, so basically, again, we, the thing about threads is that they're basically the same concept again. It's exact, basically the same thing under the hood. So the first thing is that we need a scheduler. The scheduler basically does exactly the same thing. The scheduler is basically going to receive a set of IOs. Every single time you do something like read file, the scheduler is going to receive an IO and a callback. And I'll talk about what that callback is in a bit. And that is also true about the initial program, right? You start with an initial program. It's basically the same as it was before. The main difference is that instead of a callback being a single frame with some variables attached to it, a callback, the callback is resume from the current stack frame. So now instead of having only one, one frame, one piece of code that you're going to invoke with the variables that were around it, now you have the entire representation of the stack, which has where you started from, any, um, any methods that you got to along the way, and the current stack frame. Every stack frame has a set of local variables. So instead of having one, we have a bunch. Also remembers where it is located. Um, and then the callback basically just says resume thread. Uh, this is obvious. I'm intentionally leaving out details here, um, mostly implementation details. But this is the basic idea. There is a bunch of frames. And we, so we have to keep around more information. But the callback is basically resume thread. Um, in terms of what we use for our primitive status and primitive value, it's basically the same thing again. For whether things are ready, you have a select, and for getting the value, you, have, you use a read. So what basically happens here is, under the hood, we have a scheduler that has been told twice, hey, there is, I am in the middle of reading a file here, 
please let me know when you're ready. And then as, when, whenever that happens, the callback is resume the thread with this value. So the value is whatever the data was. So, and the scheduler basically looks exactly the same, except uh, under receive callbacks, instead of it being IO callback, now it's IO thread to resume. But otherwise, it's basically the same. So there are a few differences between callbacks and threads, obviously. Um, one of them is you might have code that runs simultaneously if you don't have any kind of locking. Um, that's not actually inherent in a threading system. You could have a threading system that does not allow you to run simultaneous code if that is something that you do not want to do. Um, you also might have code that runs unexpectedly interleaved. So you could have two lines of code that there's no reason for you to believe that they would run separately, but there's a random context switch and they run separately. Uh, and if you would want to, if you think that that's bad, you could disable preemptive scheduling. Again, that's, that's not specific. That's not inherent in a threading system. It's just usually there in threading systems. Um, one thing that is not uh, optional is obviously because the callback is storing more frames, there's more memory that has to be used to store the callback structure. So that's something that you can't avoid. Um, but I, I think some people have the mistaken impression that in modern threading systems, you just start with like some number of megabytes of stack, and you basically, every single time you start a new thread, you get like eight megabytes or 16 megabytes or four megabytes, whatever people say out loud. That's usually not true. In most threading systems, you start with a small amount of stack, and the operating system will grow the thread as necessary. So you typically are not ending up, you're typically not using tons of RAM if you ha make a few threads, unless you have big stacks. And again, I just want to reiterate that async code can and usually does have global mutable, shared mutable state and interleaved execution. You can't actually control exactly when things happen. And if you are using callbacks in order to emulate basically threaded execution, you're going to end up with essentially the same story where you have a bunch of nested callbacks and you can't actually, essentially any one of those places is a place for interleaved state to for another callback, rather, to cause something to happen interleaved. So yes, you can look at it and understand where the interleavings are possible. But in practice, you end up with basically a lot of nested callbacks where you would just have a lot of sequential statements. Um, I want to clear up one, one point of confusion, um, which is about fibers. So I think a lot of people are like, oh, threads, they, those suck. Threads are big. Threads are, uh, they allow simultaneous execution. Threads use too many resources. So we can, like, we'll use something called fibers. So, like, there's node fibers, right? There's no node threads, but there are node fibers. And people, um, some people know what fibers are for, and some people think, oh, you, if you don't like threads for some reason and you want, you like the async model, if you use fibers, you're still doing the async model, but you don't have the problems. So the, the sad fact is that, actually, if you imagine that, that, that JavaScript had fibers, the model would be exactly the same as before with threads. We just like replace the word thread for the word fiber. That's how it would look. And the implementation, you would be able to implement read files, something like this. You would say like, give me the current fiber, read async, and then inside, uh, in the callback for read async, you would resume the fiber and you'd return a, the yielded fiber. And then later on, whenever read async returned, it would basically continue execution. Um, so th there is a nice thing here, which is that we can implement a semantic that before had to be implemented in the VM, the value part um, in JavaScript code or in whatever language. But this is not actually, this doesn't actually solve any of the problems that we had before. We still have the same stack that we have to store off in memory somewhere. We still have the possibility of interleaved execution because the fiber.yield can happen anywhere down the stack. So as far as you're concerned, yes, some JavaScript code had to yield the fiber, but that's not actually from a programming model that different from the VM yielded the thread. So you basically don't end up with a lot of benefit. Um, it is true that fibers are usually a little bit lighter because implementations make them lighter, but there's no reason why you cannot implement, take a fiber implementation and make it a thread implementation, rename fiber to thread and have the yielding happen automatically in the VM, it would basically be the same thing. Um, usually fibers are just slightly better exposed versions of green threads. So that is, for example, true in Ruby. So Ruby got native threads in Ruby 1.9 and has fibers as a fallback if people want green threads. Um, so to recap, uh, the short version is, if you, are, if you are working on a system where there is deterministic order, threads are a useful mechanism for dealing with asynchronous events, asynchronous events that arrive in deterministic order. And the, I, again, I think the important thing here is 
There is nothing actually about threads other than the fact that you have to store extra stuff. So there's going to be more stuff held, held in memory that makes this a worse system than your callbacks. So uh, yes, the, if, you are, if you want a million concurrent requests, you probably are going to want to do something more low level. But if you're dealing with people talk about 1,000 concurrent requests or 100 concurrent requests, in that situation, it really does not matter. You can, you can basically use the extra RAM and get a better programming model. Um, so when to use callbacks? Uh, there's a lot of reasons, but I want to talk about one specific reason, um, something that, hap that happens a lot in Ember applications. So we have a, huh. um, I didn't talk about yield yet, I'll talk about it soon. Uh, so we have an object which is a Ember view and we have inside of it a callback which says this view was inserted into the DOM. And then we do something, in this case we call flot. And that is one way to do it. Another way to do it would be to use some kind of synchronous abstraction so that we can basically insert into the DOM and then once the thing was inserted into the DOM, you get a view back and you call flot, right? So basically the bottom way allows you to work like it's, like it's synchronous code and the top way actually has an asynchronous callback. And from everything I've said so far, you might imagine that I would prefer the bottom way. But there's actually some problems with the bottom way. Um, the, the, they all come down basically to encapsulation, which is... In this particular case, it's not actually good for the caller to care about the fact that flot is being called. So first of all, the caller has to care. That sucks. But why does that matter? First of all, it basically means that you could screw up and you could forget to call it. And it always needs to be called. And it also means that you can't take this object and give it to someone else and say, OK, the contract is that you call create and append, and that's it. You now have to say, the contract for this particular view is make sure to call append with yield and make sure to call flot afterwards. So basically, if you have an object, and that object wants to do things in sequence based on external asynchronous events, uh, and th those sequences always required in order to basically get to the endpoint, just use lifecycle hooks. Even though you might imagine that it would be better to do it synchronously, you basically, uh, it basically breaks encapsulation to do things synchronously in that situation. So let's talk about uh, JavaScript. So, so far we've been talking about imaginary JavaScript that will never happen. So let's talk about real JavaScript. Um, so everything I've said so far about, about order actually breaks an invariant that JavaScript has that can't be broken which is that if you have two statements that are next to each other in a function body, they actually have to run one after another. We are, not, we are not okay with uh, saying that perhaps there may be some code that happens in between these two functions unless you do something to explicitly request that. So if you look at some JavaScript code and there's two statements next to each other, they must run one after another. There cannot be other code run in between. And this is, not a, this is a guarantee of the, of the programming model. And if you break it, it will break existing code. So um, the reason it will break existing code is that there are, uh, you may, basically there may be existing code that uses abstractions that change their mind about how to implement things. And all of a sudden, like guarantees that you had before don't exist anymore. So again, this is an example, right? We have, this is what we want. We want thread. The problem is that uh, we, we are allowing th code to run in between, and this was, no, was not possible before and is now possible and basically breaks backwards compatibility, essentially, so we cannot actually implement this. Um, but sequential abstractions are still useful. We would like to not have to do that as a callback if possible, so maybe there's a way that we can get to sequential abstractions because they're useful without breaking the programming model. Um, and the solution that um, ES ECMAScript 6 provides for this is called generators, which have been in Firefox for a long time. And actually, the ES6 version of them are in Firefox today. And the basic model is that you uh, explicitly say, this is a function that can have interleaved code, basically. This is a function that is a generator. Um, and then there is a new keyword, which is yield, which basically says, I, I am allowing something else to run some code now, basically. So, um, in this case, we have jQuery.getJSON. Um, so this is an example that is loosely adapted from a thing called TaskJS by Dave Herman, who's on TC39, who's basically showing an example of using the generator API to make sequential abstractions. So basically, jQuery.getJSON would normally have a callback that says when it's done. And in this case, you would basically say, no, I'm going to yield to jQuery.getJSON or yield jQuery.getJSON to something else. And then that thing will give me the JSON whenever it's ready. And the same thing, I will yield request animation frame, which is basically going to pause until I have an animation frame instead of a callback, and I can do element.fadein. Right? So here I'm basically 
getting JSON, making a new element, and then fading it in at the right time. So normally that would require multiple nested callbacks. Here we can unwrap the callbacks into, a, into something flat. Um, I am imagining that there is a scheduler here which does not, does not exist, right? We don't actually have a scheduler. But this basically satisfies the I have a scheduler and initial program uh, part of what we were talking about before. Um, so, so far, basically, our status and values have been things that the VM knows about. So the VM knows how to do a timeout. The VM knows how to do um, I.O. But in our case, we actually will want jQuery.kJSON to be able to hook into this, um, to the life cycle. And so we need to figure out how to expose the ideas of status and value. Am I ready to be called yet? And what is my value? We have to expose that to user land. And the way that, one way of dealing with this is something called promises. And this is actually how Task.js deals with it. So basically the idea is that we need a standard way to talk about status and value in, in JavaScript code so that whatever thing is doing the scheduling doesn't have to constantly learn again what it means to do status and value for the particular thing, which would make it impossible to build a scheduler in the first place. So here's an example of a promise uh, with our file example. So we say file.read make a new promise, and return the promise. But in between, we basically say, OK, wait for a read. And in the callback, if the, there's an error, call promise.error. Otherwise, call promise.resolve with a value. And that promise.resolve with the value in the middle is basically the value part. right? It's basically how we are telling some other system this is the value that you are waiting for. So basically, there, there's a, there is some kind of scheduler that has received a promise. And it is basically able to know that when it is going to resume the yield, it knows what the actual value is. Because we now have an API for talking about that concept. So here is an example, which again, it's a stupid example. But you can imagine a better non-blocking prompt. right? So uh, we have a prompt. It makes a new promise. It shows the confirmed dialog. So imagine we want to do a prompt like in one part of the page. Shows the confirmed dialog. And whenever you hit a key press, if it is a 13 key press, then resolve with the current value. right? So basically, now we can spawn. So spawn is basically the API of task.js. Um, so that's basically doing the spawn is a scheduler. So we say spawn yield, prompt, and basically that is saying, go wait until the promise is resolved. So for the purposes of this function, wait until the promise is resolved. But what's great is that the rest of the program could keep running. right? So the rest of the program doesn't care about this particular generator. The rest of the program could do whatever it wants. And then once the prompt has resolved with the value, we say console log entry. right? So basically, that's how the two pieces go together. We have our status is basically. Um, our status is basically a jQuery event, right? So we're not even using any information from the VM. It's not like a file system event or something. It's basically like we have decided that when the user presses enter, specifically that specific event, we are going to say that the primitive, the status is ready. So this, uh, this point in the program is ready. And, and here is the value. So this is how, basically, this is how you can use generators to implement both the status and value part of the larger program. And I think what's important is that promises are, are primitive. They basically give us a way to talk about whether some asynchronous event is ready yet and what its value is. And I think that's an, like you could easily use that as a low-level feature if you want. And there are cases where you might want to do that. But what I think is great is that if you combine generators with promises, now you have a sequential abstraction that lets you take asynchronous events that would normally have to run in a particular, that would normally have to have multiple nested callbacks and run them sequentially without having to do, get any special help from the VM. Right? So the VM has basically given us the generator primitive. We have agreed upon a promises primitive, and we can basically implement something like task.js. Um, also, what's great about this, this approach is that we can actually take something that's sequential that's for a little part of the app, like prompt, and make that sequential without making the entire program block. Right? So basically, generators let us say, OK, this part of the code I care about the order of these three things. The rest of the code, I want you to keep running. And as long as they're isolated from each other, obviously, if, they're, if it's code that's, that uh, interacts with each other, you probably do not want to allow them to be running sequentially and interleaved. But maybe, maybe this is just like a thing that has no effect on the rest of the page. You can basically get sequential code without worrying about, um, without worrying about blocking the entire UI. So this is a pseudocode for how you might implement the spawn function. So the spawn function takes a generator and an optional value. So the first time it, it gets called, it will not receive a value. Basically goes and calls the generator with the value. And basically what that means is that, and initially, again, it will be undefined, which basically means to start, just run the, 
generator until you get to a yield. And the promise over there is basically what's yielded out. So when you say like yield jQuery.getJSON, promise over there is going to be whatever jQuery.getJSON returned. And then uh, you basically say, okay, whenever the promise was successful, basically spawn, run the generator again with the value that you got back from the successful callback. When the promise fails, do generator that throw error. So you can actually throw an error inside, which will give us um, synchronous error handling. And then basically keep doing that until you, when you call generator.send, you get a stop iteration error, in which case um, be done. Otherwise, for any other error, basically rethrow the error. So this is a really simple spawner, but the base, and again, I'm sure uh, it is much simpler than what a real implementation would actually do. But the basic idea here is that by everybody agreeing that there is a thing called a promise, which has a success and a fail callback on it, um, then we can basically just have this gen general purpose spawner that lets us have synchronous code. And one thing that's really great is that jQuery already actually implements all this asynchronous stuff in terms of promises. So this already works today. You can say yield jQuery.getJSON URL today using task.js and it will work right now. And I think that's actually pretty awesome. Um, another thing about generators is that generators, because they are explicit, you have to say function star. And because they are shallow, basically you call a generator and it yields back to you, you it tends to require less memory than a full stack because there is no full stack. You only, you basically have to call into a generator and it calls back into you. Um, how, generators can be explicitly chained though. If you actually, if you need, um, if you need a, a bigger stack, so like you are calling into an abstraction that is itself calling into an abstraction, you can um, yield down and then you get a little bit of depth. So basically generators let you implement whatever level of abstraction and by default they're pretty memory efficient. Um, so one thing um, that I think is cool about promises is that the general principle makes sense in other languages that don't have the same restrictions as JavaScript. So you can imagine in Ruby, let's say, having a file API and Imagine that there, there's an async read primitive. So you can basically say, make a new promise, async read, and when you get the string back, resolve the promise with the string, and then yield, basically thread.yield. So this is the equivalent of the code. Um, and you could imagine implementing this in terms of mutexes or some other synchro synchronization primitive that exists in existing languages. And I think um, get, basically getting everyone to agree about what a promise actually is allows people to do more interesting things, which I think is cool. So. That's all good about um, events that come in a particular order. So in other words, where the idea of, having, of taking asynchronous events and making a synchronous abstraction out of them that does not block the entire UI or block the entire process, that's a good idea if that's the case. But now let's talk about the case where you have events that arrive out of order. And this is basically what happens when you're building a UI app. So the first one is what happens when you build node, node apps, right? All the events are a, are a network, they're all based on a known protocol, the, everything is basically synchronous conceptually, but you're using async to get performance. In a UI, it's a little bit different. So first of all, there are, there's the concept of um, external, so I wanna break up the type of events into external and internal events. So what an external event basically is, is an event that happens from, that is not part of your application. So the browser, uh, the browser returns IO, let's say indexDB or Ajax, a set timeout gets called, there's a mutation observer, Actually, these are, sorry, uh, I, my categorization is not what I just said. So basically, there's two types of external events. So the top should say, like, browser events, basically. So these are events that are not part of your application. So there's um, things like I.O., things like set timeout, things like DOM mutation observers. These are things that the browser does. And then there's things that the user does. The user might click, swipe, close a tab, et cetera. So these are all events that are not part of your application. They're events that your application is being told about. Um, and then there's another category, which is internal events. And those are events that you generate yourself inside of your app to promote decoupling. So that your app, basically this is a common pattern um, that things like Backbone.js and other, um, even jQuery actually uses. Basically you use events inter inside of your app so that parts of your app don't have to know about each other. And I'll, let me show an example of this. So we make a really simple evented object. An evented object is basically a function. It takes a property hash, copies the properties over. And then uh, on set, it basically calls two events. So we're imagining that there's an event emitter that has a fire on it. Um, so whenever uh, property, whenever you set a property, it sets, uh, fires a property called will change, sets the property, and then fires an event called did change on that key. And why this is useful is, so let's make a new person, myself, and then we'll go take the person and put it in the DOM. So uh, Again, as always, these examples are 
intentionally simplified. So you take the you take the HTML, you put in the DOM, you get my first name, my last name, and you basically say, okay, event emitter, whenever the first name changes, go update the first name in the DOM, and whenever the last name changes, update the last name in the DOM. So this this basically allows us to say, I don't actually care. The person who changes the first name and last name does not have to care about how that affects the DOM. And so you could imagine that you go and do a network call for a person slash me, and when the person slash me comes in, you go set the first name and set the last name, and that will basically go and update the first name and last name. So you, maybe you poll repeatedly to see if the person's name was updated, and whenever it updates, you go set, and that will basically keep the DOM up to date. And the nice thing here is that the part of your system that is concerned about the network does not have to be concerned about the part of your, only has to be concerned about the part of your system which is the data model, and the part of your system that is the data model is basically uh, does not have to care about the part of your system which is rendering, right? So you basically can start breaking up your application into different concerns and not have to have the ones that are talking to the network also be concerned about the DOM, which are far away concerns from each other. So this is basically, I think, what everyone implements initially, something like this. Um, but you actually hit a problem pretty quickly. So let's, let's say that, okay, we make a new evented object and we, um, I don't want to have to constantly be like doing something special with my first name and last name, so I create a function that returns my full name. And it basically just get, concatenates my first name and last name with a space. So awesome, I start with, uh, I basically do the same thing, except this time I don't make spans, I just put in my full name. And then I say, okay, whenever the first name changed, update the full name, whenever the last name changes, update the full name. Um, so this is, ba this is actually a relatively normal pattern that people actually do. Now the problem is that if you go and do this, if you go and set the first name and last name, you are going to end up rendering two times, right? Because as far as those events are concerned, they don't know that you're in the middle of doing multiple operations. They're just, their whole idea is that you're decoupled. So you basically end up having no way, because you have decoupled the system from each other, you have no way to know that what you're in the middle of doing is atomic. So pro the, the solution that you basically want in response to that is like some concept of a transaction. And Basically, let's, let's look at what you do. So you basically, you have your same first name and last name problem, but now, instead of immediately updating the DOM in the, chain, in the underlying changes, you basically say, okay, whenever first name changes, I want you to emit full name, but using a, a special unique emitter. And the only difference between an emitter and a unique emitter is that the unique emitter basically coalesces events. So you're basically going to keep calling the unique emitter over and over again, and later on you're going to flush all the changes, and it's going to be responsible for making sure that the same event does not call, get called multiple times. So here we basically say, okay, whenever the first name changes, I want you to fire full name to change on the unique emitter. Same thing here. And then, oh, when the unique emitter's full name change gets called, I want you to update the DOM. And then in the network, part of the app, you'll basically say, okay, start a transaction for unique emitter, make all my changes, and then call commit. And that's basically going to say, okay, unique emitter, time, your time is up, now go do everything, and that's going to cause the DOM to get updated only one time. So that's conceptually what you want. Unfortunately, this is not a good API for users, right? You, you don't want to have to tell the users, oh, make sure you always start a transaction, and make sure you, like, you use, set up all these multiple le levels of events, and make sure you use the unique emitter. Right? It's, it's not a very good user-facing abstraction, but it actually is a pretty, something like this is a pretty good primitive. Um, so actually what we end up wanting is an abstraction for this kind of data flow that is represented using something like data bindings. So um, again, the specifics are not important, but I will basically show you what Ember does, which is the project that I work on in, jo in, in JavaScript land. Um, again, I don't, the important thing here is just how we get around this problem, not the specific implementation. So the first thing is we basically have the same thing. Em all ember.objects are like the equivalent of evented object. And here we, j instead of having the full name be a function, it's a function that has an annotation on it which basically says um, I depend on first name and last name. So this is like the, sh the function that prototype extended version. There's also a version that does not require it where you pass the function into another function to get the annotation on it. But the basic idea here is that this function knows that it has dependencies on first name and last name. So we're going to go in and stick the HTML, uh, the full name in the HTML, and then in this case, we don't have to add multiple observers. We just add an observer on full name, and under the hood, Ember sees, okay, that's a computer property. That's not a regular property. I know what the dependencies are. I'll do the equivalent of setting up that unique emitter, those unique emitter events, and whenever the full name actually changes, I will go update the full name. And behind the scenes, Ember uses the fact that the browser already has, basically has the notion 
of a transaction around user code, right? So when the browser calls into user code, it basically calls the user code. There's a bunch of frames. Eventually, the browser will exit the top frame of user code, and now the user code is done running. So we basically use the fact that there's already a natural transaction in JavaScript code to, uh, to say, OK, you set the first name. We're not going to flush the event yet. We're basically going to send that, unique, that event, um, uh, store off a unique full name event, and move on. And then the same thing happens with the last name. And because of the fact that we haven't done anything yet, the last name, the fact that last name changes full name doesn't do anything. Basically says, oh, yes, in fact, I already know that full name is updated, so throw that away. And then later on, we will basically go and execute and flush all the, all the changes. So uh, in this case, there's only one change. It's that the full name was changed. And that will mean that the DOM will automatic, that event will get called and will update the DOM once. Um, so basically, the, the point here is, you could, in fact, implement everything using events, using basically immediately executed events on, for data changes. But very quickly, this is just one example of something that goes wrong. Because you're using events, you basically don't have enough visibility into the system. The abstraction is not strong enough. And you end up having to do more and more work to avoid crazy things from happening. So you want an abstraction, I contend, something like data bindings, to hide the fact that there is uh, that there's problems with the underlying events and basically do some coalescing for you. So a good data binding system can provide an abstraction for data flow for objects that are inside the system. Right? So if, you, if you're only talking about ember.objects, no problem. We can do all that work. We can do the coalescing. We can do all that stuff for you. But obviously, if you, the DOM doesn't really know anything about that. So we can't actually, we can't immediately automatic extend that that uh, concept over to the DOM. And basically, uh, what that means is that you, will, you end up, uh, at first glance, having to implement um, at the boundary, specifically at the boundary, an observer, something that is uh, asynchronous. Right? So um, the goal of a data binding system is to keep inside the system, not have to worry about asynchrony. But if you want to talk outside the system, obviously now the asynchrony comes back. But actually, um, for cases that are really common, we can do better. We can do a better job. So in, specifically in the case of the DOM in Ember, we have a template engine that knows, that knows about data bindings. So in this case, the person is still the same. We make a person view. We basically say, OK, the person's full name is bound to person.full name. And here's the template. The template is basically just insert full name. Um, and Ember, Ember's templates basically automatically have data binding all the way through to the template. So all the semantics that we talked about before about coalescing basically apply all the way through. Uh, you'll notice that there's no, there's no place in this code, this is all the code that you actually write, there's no place in this code where you set up an observer. So we have actually managed to eliminate the last piece of asynchronous code in this situation. So again, obviously if you're doing something off the beaten track, if you're talking to a WebSocket, probably you will still need to have asynchrony at the boundary. But for common cases, we can write abstractions that get rid of asynchrony, where we don't have to worry about the fact that there's asynchronous events anymore. Um, if you do that, if you take an async abstraction that you wrote and ex extend it to an external system, it's actually very important that you don't change the semantics for the external system. right? So Ember's data bindings, when they apply to the DOM, are basically the same. They have the same semantics, the same coalescing, the same timing semantics as regular bindings. It's just that we have written a declarative abstraction that lets you not have to worry about the fact that behind the scenes, there's asynchronous external things happening. So finally, I'll just sort of reiterate what I've been saying. I think applications should not have a large amount of asynchronous code in them. Um, in a lot of cases, the application may want to write an abstraction that takes asynchronous code and makes it synchronous. Uh, that might be a useful, uh, a useful thing for you to do in your own application. One common thing that people do is they'll use an asynchronous reactor for the raw I.O., but then they'll use threads for the actual things that happen whenever there's an event. So that way you can have 100,000 or a million open connections. And because most of the time things are idle, you're not actually, you don't actually run things on threads. But when something needs to happen, you basically spin up threads, and then you have the sequential abstraction there. So that's a, a pretty common thing. And that's something you probably want to do in general, is if you are noticing that your application is massively async, like async is everywhere, you'll probably want to say, OK, how do, I, how do I push the async code off to the side and expose an abstraction that's, that's less async for the rest of my application? And again, there's different kinds of asynchronous code. There's um, asynchronous code that arises in strict deterministic order. And for this, we've been doing this for a long time. Basically, something like threads are the right abstraction for this problem. Um, 
And then there's uh, events that arrive in non-deterministic order. And those, and in this case, even internal events, events that we're running ourselves, have different semantics from external events, right? So the way that you deal with asynchronous code is not always the same. I'm not saying I have a panacea, use data bindings everywhere, use threads. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that there are solutions for, for different types of asynchrony, and you can use them in the situation that the appropriate situation. I um, also want to say that promises are actually a pretty nice abstraction on top of asynchronous code, but I, I actually think that they're not, a, they're not a high level enough abstraction for most cases. They're not really the end of the story. Um, so if you ha once you have promises, you can build something like task.js on top of promises, and then now you have three levels of abstraction. You have the raw asynchronous events, you have the promises, and you have task.js, and you can use whatever level of abstraction is appropriate. And I would contend that in a, re a regular application, most of the time, you're going to be wanting to use something like task.js and not promises and not the raw asynchronous events. But if you need to, if, if task.js for some reason isn't doing exactly what you need, um, and I'm not saying task.js is necessarily the right way to wire up generators with promises, but something like that, um, then you can basically drop down. So you want to build these systems in layers so you can do that. Uh, thank you very much. And I will take any questions. Any questions? Hi, Jeff Tyrus Princeton. Um, I was wondering if you are familiar with Taint.js, um, which is a library for basically allowing you to have um, some abstractions that make code look like it's synchronous, but it actually just rewrites it to be asynchronous, and, and what your thoughts are on that approach. Yeah, so that's basically, the, that's fine. That's, that's essentially what I'm saying. I would rather if the VM had something like a generator that would let you not have to go re rewrite massive amounts of code. I'm always nervous about something that's processing my code and writing async and like converting it into some completely different code, but that's, that seems fine. If, the only reason why I don't end up using something like that is that most of my JavaScript code is UI, and like I was talking about in the second half of my talk, I don't actually think that converting UI into synchronous style makes sense. I think that you want something more like data bindings, which preserves the fact that things are out of order, but hides the fact that there's so much asynchrony actually happening. Okay. Thanks. Hi, what do you think about web workers? Because web workers are sort of, in my perspective, this sort of half-baked attempt to sort of put threads into HTML5. But so, so what do you think about that? Uh, so I, I wouldn't call web workers half-baked. So there's some, there's some uh, limitations that we have. The biggest limitation being uh, we cannot change the JavaScript programming model to have interleave code. So basically what web workers are doing is they're letting you run code that is not on the main UI thread without having it share the same, uh, the same state. So uh, it basically means since you have threads, now it's actually easier to write real synchronous code, right? You can, um, so like IndexedDB has a synchronous mode. You can go in a thread and say, I, I don't think you can run the synchronous mode on the main thread, but in a thread you can basically write regular synchronous code. Um, but there are a lot of cases where you will want to share state. So in Ember, for example, we could not run every, a lot of things on threads because the cost of serializing and extracting the information would be too high. So we basically need to manage the asynchrony on the main thread still. Um, I think for cases like if you have, if you have an index DB and you like want to run an indexing job, basically, like you're couch DB and you want to run an indexing job, totally do that in, um, in, a, web, in a web worker. And if you are, if you're doing things that don't have anything to do with the UI or if the serialization cost is low, you can totally use web workers to get around some of the, the limitations. Um, I just find that in most of these cases, I end up needing shared state. Right, so I, 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 there is information in the program that I would like to extract in, the, in that something else, and I can't really, can't really basically have them run in different processes. I also, um, the implementations of web workers are um, unknown. Like, there's unknown performance characteristics, so you're allowed to implement it as a separate process, or as a thread, or as something else. And I, I think we, I personally want to see more like what the actual performance characteristics in real browsers are before I would feel comfortable doing it. Again, in any case where the serialization, pay, the serialization load is high. Um, and, and one last thing, um, there's actually a cool attempt to make the serialization cost lower um, in Chrome for binary data, which allows you to basically take binary data and no cost transfer it into a web worker, which I guess in Chrome must mean that they're essentially saying that it's a thread. Um, but yeah, you can basically take you can take binary data in the main thread and give it to a web worker and not have it copy. So that's nice.
Thanks. Anybody else? I used to program way, way back in EDA, and it has a notion of rendezvous. And some of this reminds me a little bit of that. Do you, are you I don't right? know anything about rendezvous in EDA. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> they invented a lot of things in threading, so it might be interesting to look at. Yep. Yeah, I think um, one thing I hand weighed over a lot was dealing with, so when you actually use threads, you have to deal with some shared mutable state, parallelizability, depending on what thread imp implementation you're using. I think that that's basically implementation detail. If, if you thought threads were a good abstraction, you should just write one that doesn't have the problems that you, don't, that you want. And in fact, most modern languages basically do that. Right? They give you enough tools to build whatever implementation you want. Um, but in fact, you do have to worry about shared mutable state. So um, I, I think instance isolation is actually a pretty, in web applications on the server is a pretty good solution because you basically end up with a request object that has all the state in it and hopefully you're not sharing that request object across threads. So you, in most application code, again, this does not apply to web frameworks, but in most application code, if you, you can avoid a lot of mutable state problems by just making sure that you're keeping everything isolated to your request object, which usually ends up being a controller or something like that in a framework. Yes. Well, so that kind of sort of answered my question, which was um, how does this relate to what you choose to, um, or what level of abstraction you choose to uh, structure your services and your uh, actual asynchronous calls to the server at? Sure. Um, so I think the fact that Tame.js exists at all basically means that, I mean, it basically proves the point that the, that you can essentially end up with interleaved code and threads and fibers are, uh, threads and async callbacks are essentially semantically equivalent. Um, can you, so wh what is your exact question? I'm sorry. Um, oh, um, it's, I'm sort of asking your, your preference or opinion on what you choose to, uh, what, what you want to push off to the server. Ah. How, much, how much asynchronous stuff are you, are you pushing off onto the server versus keeping in the browser? So this is like the bigger question of like what is the division of responsibility between the server and client? Right, do you think, given, given your opinions on, on you know, asynchronous code in, in JavaScript, what do you think, how do you uh, think, does that, does that change the usual answers? Um, so I guess, so one, server code is nice because you can, it, it has inherent ways to deal with this problem. Um, but I, I mean, in general, I'm definitely a believer in, the, in more, more things ending up on the client. I think there's some big problems. I think the web itself has big wins around URLs and searchability, specifically indexability. And I think where we are heading as a industry is hurting indexability a lot. And, I don't, and Google doesn't seem to be doing a lot to help yet. So there is a pro, I think, Indexability is, I think people think of it as SEO. If I didn't have to worry about SEO, <laughs> ah, it would be so easy. But, and, but actually SEO is just like the anchor that holds the house down, I think. Yeah. I think the fact is that people care about indexability outside of SEO. And if, if magically all of a sudden nobody had to worry about SEO, a lot of people who were not application developers would be upset that they couldn't use Google to find information. Right? So yeah. if the New York Times tomorrow decided, okay, no more HTML, we're just going to like use JSON and render our templates on the client, you would no longer be able to search the New York Times on Google. And there isn't actually a very good answer for that. So um, I think unless Google has a solution which is basically here is a template engine, if you give me JSON, we will know what the contents are. Like maybe they will do that. But if they do not do that, we're going to have to render HTML, at least for indexability on the server for the foreseeable future. Mm -hmm. um, my preference is to try to figure out a way to reuse at least templating code. But that's, I think most of the stuff that does that right now is, an exper is experimentation, but I think you should not be fooled by that and think it will never be resolved. I, my, I, would, I would be massively surprised if in something like one year from now there wasn't a lot of, there weren't a few solutions that allowed you to have a good client-side application that also rendered HTML on the server for indexability. Um, so uh, how, how much, if any, of your comparison of when to use and when not to use asynchrony, uh, should we take any of that as an opinion on whether people should be writing servers using Node? Um, I think the Node community could do a better job of hiding asynchrony. So basically the Node community has said, basically their argument it comes down to 
because under the hood the network stack is asynchronous, therefore you should write applications in an asynchronous style. I, there's like big cloud magic here somewhere in the middle of that. I have no idea where that is. I agree. Um, but the awesome thing is that the network stack actually is asynchronous under the hood and Node actually does provide good tools for, for working with that, those primitives. They just, so basically here's the test for me. The test is when, e, when ES6 generators land in the version of V8 that they use in Node, does the Node community start to do, to do things with, those, with that tool to help make synchronous style more plausible or do they religiously object to it on the grounds that synchronous style is a bad idea? And if, basically if they insist that you have to write applications in asynchronous style forever, I do not like Node and, I, and unfortunately that is the Node community right now, right? So the Node community today is you are a bad person if you do not write your application in asynchronous style. And so I'm, I'm not, I don't enjoy that. And I don't, I think that's a, I think that's a, a bad abstraction actually. So, um, but they're right that uh, if you, if you have a, a, if you can't use threads, which you can't in V8, and you don't have any me mechanism for, me for modeling the, asyn the synchronous behavior, your gut, you have no choice but to use, to e either only have one request at a time or to use asynchronous style. So let's see, when they, when they get better solutions, will they use them? Or, or to use a language that actually does have threads. I mean, there, there exists the option of not using JavaScript. I think, I, yeah, so I, I agree. I, I, in fact, my server applications are not written in JavaScript, right? Um, I think there's a good reason why people, I think there are reasons why people like to write their servers in JavaScript, but I think I am a ninja hardcore distributed systems programmer, but, but I'm using Node because I only know JavaScript and don't want to learn another language does not make sense to me as an argument. So I, I think basically for me, Node has, it has like one of the best HTTP stacks around, like it's hard to find better ones. Um, certainly Ruby has nothing that's as good, for example, but Node also has this like religious zealotry that makes me not attracted to using it as a tool. If I was writing an extremely low level HTTP server and I didn't have to worry about like multi-core, multi-process, I probably would consider using it. All right, thank you very much.